Hello everyone, my name is Eli Flanagan, and after the blue screen decides to go away, I'm going to tell you the title of my talk, as you can already read. Uh, so, uh, if I haven't met you, um, it's nice to meet you. Just come say hi to me afterward or something. Uh, what I'd like to share uh, is a loose collection of some tips I've found uh, that I enjoy working with something called Nix. And, uh, it's one of its kind of subset features, which is called flakes. Um, so with that, I'm curious what people might, uh, what, what do you think this is in the photo? A pickaxe. Great. I, I hear Matic. Yeah, very specific word. And that's, that's I love it. Um, so kind of frames it. Uh, for me, this is a friend. This is a useful tool. Because the personal connection here is I'm not going around uh, destroying things, but a thing. In my backyard, there was a calorie pair, which if any of you are familiar, they spread like wild. And after a certain point, they split. They like to crash cars. They are very ornamental, and they're invasive. So I've had one in my backyard and had it cut down. But the position of the tree is in the corner of my backyard, with, where there is a wooden fence. And they couldn't get the, scrump, the stump grinder in. So that meant I am left with a job. And the job is to take this and repeatedly hit it and hit it and hit it. So uh, it, for me, thinking about NICs, about dependencies, about software, uh, for me, it, it connects to that image. Like, it can feel very boring. It can feel very defeating. Uh, sometimes I don't want to keep doing this. Uh, so with that, I guess, uh, how would you fill in the blank? So software is fun. Software is cool. cool. Frustrating. Frustrating. Yeah, yeah, I like it. So uh, I, I don't have an answer here, too. I should say, like, software is money. Software is money. Yeah. Undefined. Undefined. <laughs> That's a tribute to all you JavaScripters out there. <laughs> I, one thing I was thinking about, because I. A lot of this talk is heavily influenced by a book I read uh, about metaphor. So I was like, OK, what's a cool metaphor for software, right? Like, what can bring it all together? What's the unifying axiom? Uh, don't have one. But I was thinking, hey, software is like sugar. It's in everything. You eat too much of it, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, let's kind of continue that and just uh, reflect on your experience of dependencies, software dependencies. So it's not the thing you're building, or it's not the thing that you're interacting with directly. It's the thing below that that you need to get working in order for you to do your work. What are some phrases or images you've heard to describe dependencies? Oh, dependency hell. <laughs> dependency hell. Dependency hell. Yeah. Taxes and death. <laughs> Taxes and death. And any happy images from anyone? They're like, I kind of feel like some of this. Really frustrating, yeah. yeah. Uh, metaphors of pain, question mark, is my next title. Dependency hell. DLL hell, which for me, I just had to find that off the internet and just pause for a moment on the beauty of that, like how many L's are in that, and just like, <laughs> I have never really worked with dynamic linking libraries. Is that it? Or OK, because correct me, because I will be wrong. Uh, and then another one, I found the dependency carousel. Did anyone used to read Dr. Dobbs' sure. like newsletter? Yeah. So I have a link in the end to the actual web archive of that, I think. So either way, hell, carousels, um, the general feelings, no one really likes them. <laughs> Death and taxes. <laughs> I'll make myself laugh too much and interrupt the talk. Um, so that's just, I would say, a framing. Like for me is trying to get into why does it matter to talk about dependencies? What might make a dependency tool better? Uh, what might make something more uh, possible or enjoyable? Um, or what might frustrate you less? I think it's probably where I like ending is that it's not so much about a golden uh, bullet or something that takes away all your problems, but maybe it's something that doesn't have as sharp edges, so you bleed less. 
uh, to demonstrate sort of what Nix is and what flakes are and how we can kind of play with them, what I'd like to do is uh, explore another tool on Mac OS that helps you quickly bring up Linux instances. So this is called Lima. And so this is uh, Linux uh, virtual machines on Macintosh. Uh, so it's like a portmanteau combination of Linux and then Mac. And what I've found is it's really nice for having a clean, pure Linux environment on a Mac machine. And so I know there's lots of other options, like I've used Docker, I've used Vagrant. Um, I, I, I've heard of HyperKit. It's like lower, even lower level, like interfaces directly. Multitask. Multitask, is Multitask. that it? Multipass, interesting. Is that another like, uh, okay, even better. I will, okay. We've got another thing to follow up on, because I'm curious about you know, how, how it might work. Um, so with that, let me swap over. Yeah, we'll just quit out of that. So what I'm going to do here is just walk through uh, just a quick demo of like, how we can use Lima uh, on a Mac machine. So I went ahead and downloaded this in the background, because what it basically does is grabs your base image of a chosen Linux distribution. And it grabs that and then uh, manages all the complexity of provisioning a Linux system yourself, uh, which is great because show of hands for who has provisioned a Linux system themselves. I'm like hardware, software, anywhere. Yeah. So what are uh, some feelings you recall from those experiences? <laughs> I see shaking of head. <laughs> Convenient. Convenient. Okay. Yeah. Drivers, yes. That could be a t-shirt, missing drivers. So uh, as, as it can be fun, it can be very educational. It's uh, often frustrating, too, because there are a lot of concerns, perhaps. Um, and so this is where I, I guess I can eat my cake, because it's kind of just doing its thing, dealing with Fuse, SSH, whatever else, uh, so I don't have to worry about you know, fumbling uh, while, while I'm talking. So as you can see, it worked. And what I'm going to run is this other command. And again, uh, like Lima, in some sense, is just abstracting over the tedium of how you interact with a direct Linux machine on another platform like Mac OS. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is run this. And then if I go back, uh, and I'm just to kind of demonstrate here, you'll notice is uh, that was the, the name I gave uh, this little VM, and then this is just you know details about the kernel. Uh, so if I go back here, uh, the, w another reason I wanted to demonstrate this is really showing how. Um, let me close this guy, and let's just go to that. So it's a little cleaner. Really showing how uh, I'm just starting with. In this case, I think it's Ubuntu. So a thing to kind of note here is Nix is a package manager. So yum, DNF, uh, brew on Mac, package managers. How you manage extra stuff, they're great. They're not great. Uh, that's kind of a whole other theme. So uh, Nix is uh, a package manager. And so that, what we could do is I'm going to just install it for uh, my user inside of this virtual machine so we can kind of start seeing a couple examples of how we might use Nix uh, in its ephemeral environments, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So you can install Nix in a couple of different ways. And I prefer single user, which is like per your user. So you need to have root access initially, because Nix has this interesting thing. Um, yeah, so what it's doing is it's elevating, it's a shell script, the installer, and it elevates using sudo. Oh, and inside of that. Inside of the, yeah. Inside of the curl? It, yes, yeah, so that, um, don't do this at home. That curl L, you know, this, this nonsense here. Uh, for, for anyone unacquainted with the ways of bash and shell, give me that executable from the internet, run it on my system. And I do all this hand waving because <laughs> Somebody out there is going to say, you know, you really shouldn't do that, Eli. And I'm like, you're right. I shouldn't do that. Um, but, you know, yeah. it's, it's questions of trust. I appreciate the philosophical pivot. And thank you. Yeah. You know, really, I'm just getting so much good support here. So 
I'll just keep doing this. Um, and, and yeah, the nice thing about Lima, I mean, just to pause on that point, because um, the context for me, too, uh, this machine's highly regulated, uh, because the company I work for works with healthcare data. And so, rightly, everybody's paranoid, um, though they restrict. I have no pseudo on my machine. So one could argue the whole reason why I'm giving this talk is because they took away pseudo, they took away the ability to change something, and I was like, I will find a way. I didn't know that, but subconsciously that's what happened. <laughs> so Lima, under the hood though, is, manages that. So it, and it, what I like is it's very small, but it, it creates a user, and it's just, it's very ergonomic. I think, I think to me that's the big thing, is like, yeah, I could do this all myself. No, I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I could spend a lot of time hitting my head up against Linux and Mac and interoperability, but I don't feel like that these days. Um, so you'll know, oh, no nicks, shucks. Now I have nicks. Um, so another little thing I'm going to do, uh, just for the sake of the talk, getting into flakes, which are um, what I find the more useful and accessible sub-feature of Nix. So Nix is a package manager. Flakes are uh, a notion of package management for Nix that I find really helpful and accessible. Um, and I can go into much greater detail, but again, show rather than uh, dive down that rabbit hole. So the first is I want to show a really trivial example uh, of, have you ever had a problem where you're like, oh, I have some software thing. There's a great tool that does that. Or maybe I don't know if this software tool is going to be useful, but I want to try it. Um, I feel like that's a lot of my life uh, in professional software development or just in not professional. I need to do something with a computer. I don't want to spend all this time. I don't even know how to write something like that, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the contexts for me has been taking PDFs and taking data out of PDFs. Um, that's another fun task, so if anyone wants to, you know, do that, go to the AI meetup, <laughs> right? Um, so there's, a, there's a, a PDF or a graphics library, I should say, called Poplar uh, Utils, uh, and it's behind a lot of Linux uh, PDF rendering. So uh, what's great, though, is with Nix, uh, and what I can do is actually, uh, let's go here run this subcommand called shell, and then I'm pointing at essentially a repository. And so Nix behind the scenes, it's all developed on GitHub. So that's why you'll see those GitHub URLs come up. But what this is saying is, hey, give me some package by the name of popular underscore utils from this place, Nix packages. And that, that little keyword's really confusing. <laughs> it's just very overloaded in Nix world. But basically, all I'm saying is, uh, I've got this cool tool now, um, uh, PDF to text. Uh, yeah, which one was it? There we go. Simple mistyping. So what I did is I went ahead and uh, downloaded a PDF file. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't, so I'll have to find one from my say home directory. Uh, actually, did I put it? Yeah, let's do this guy. So what I'm going to do is just copy, um, use another command from Lima uh, to just copy this. And I think actually I'm going to try something real quick. So one of the things that I've liked about Lima is its interoperability. So it actually will have a file system mounted for you. So that way, because I was thinking, oh, let me just do Lima control copy. You can kind of like you do command uh, or that command on the terminal. But instead, I'm like, it's a lot simpler to just put it in a directory from the Mac side and then realize I have it here. Um, and then again, right here, uh, I'm going to do this whatever this PDF file is. So PDF to text is a utility from Poplar Utils. And I found it really helpful for taking a PDF, which is essentially a drawn thing. It's images. Sometimes there's text embedded. It's all binary. So it can be hard to look at what's inside it. So PDF to text will actually do that for me. And so um, I'm missing one of the command line arguments to that. 
And so here we go. Now I can start playing with this. If we dig, grab, edit it, etc. So quick example. Um, again, I have, I'm in this Linux environment. I haven't installed PDF to text. And I'll just show that. So if I do uh, control D here, I just ex exited my next shell. So if I try to run this same command, uh, PDF to text, it's going to say it's not installed, apt install. And that's correct, because I'm in a Ubuntu context. So it's using the apt package manager. Uh, but what I found really nice about, again, being able to simply have something uh, that is connecting the software, but not actually have to install it. Like, it's, it's, it's insanely useful. Uh, so that's a trivial example uh, and something I found useful with uh, popular utils. So there's another example I have that, um, well, yeah, let me see if I can just want to take a look here. So uh, w something like PDF to text or other utilities that are pre-compiled are actually uh, maybe a little less inspiring because they're a little more easy to remain portable. But one thing uh, I'll point out is it's really the sky's the limit as far as like what kind of thing you can do in a, a shell with Nix. And so in this case, I'll just show uh, pulling up like a, an actual Java runtime. So like if I did this, like Java, same thing, it's going to say, hey, you don't have it. Um, and so with this, what I want to pull up is um, uh, Java runtime as well as its package manager. Uh, it, and the reason for this is I was just trying to uh, run this other project. Uh, I, I don't have any experience with Java. So that, that's what I should just put out there. So uh, some of you are probably looking at this and is like, what is he doing? Uh, that's great. Uh, you should, you should really come talk to me, because I was just completely confused. <laughs> I, I, I was doing this like two days ago, and I'm like, I've got the next part working, but I have no idea how to get this uh, particular file working. Um, let me see if I actually have the file, because the thing is, I, I was going to check out, um, let me see if I've got that. Yeah, I don't know if I have that one. So yeah, that, that's my punchline. <laughs> now laugh at my Java skills. So yeah, I think we'll, we'll let that one keep cooking. Th this one, I, I can follow up and go into more detail on this. This was more like for my own curiosity, is like how to actually run you know, the Java runtime. But the, the important thing is this example just illustrates it doesn't have to be a binary. It doesn't have to be some little thing that you can compile for a given target and just work. It could be a whole, a whole runtime. So an, a, a more realistic example for this, for me, has been I work on a small team. We have JavaScript projects. And so what I have been able to do is, with a flake in each of our projects, declare the same version of Node.js and Yarn. So that way, we have parity across you know, 10 projects, and then also, I just have to copy a file, uh, the, this flake file. So that, that's an example that I'm happy to kind of jump into um, more directly uh, after, after this section. So the, another like fun example that I wanted to show, has anyone ever used this piece of software, Magic Wormhole? It's, I just came across it the other day. It's really fun, um, and it sounds suspicious, like, OK, great name. What are you trying to do to me? <laughs> Uh, it's for temporarily open, opening up an encrypted connection and transferring a file, uh, which I don't know about you, but I feel like I, uh, I can transfer files like really easily, but the moment it's, oh, it has some sensitive information or it has my social and I don't want AI or whatever getting that, it's a real nightmare. It's really annoying. I have a lot of feelings about it, so I'm not going to keep going into it. So that's why I love this tool. So what I wanted to show, actually, is I brought along my, my friendly Linux laptop here. And what, so just back here, Java version, is that it? Yeah. So there we go. Java runtime, but we're going to say goodbye. Um, 
So actually, what we're going to do is try to set up a wormhole between. Um, all right, host is down. Let's try, let's try this. So bear with me a moment. What I'm going to try to do is actually connect to uh, this other machine. Try this real quick and see if I can get it. So, yeah, if, if it doesn't, that's that's quite all right because we actually might be able to just uh, explore this tool with one side doing uh, nicks and the other not. So, in this case, what I'll do is exit out of there, and then I'm going to try to open up. Uh, one of them inside of the Linux machine here. So you'll see it doesn't find the command. So what I'm going to do is uh, check it out here. And really, I just mean, again, grab this binary uh, from Nix's own package set. And then what I'm going to do is, uh, let's go back to the slides. We'll create an arbitrary file here. All right. So what now I would be able to do uh, on another machine is actually run uh, this command. And so Right now, I'm executing this from inside the Linux machine. So I think for simplicity, I'll just demonstrate, because on my uh, Mac OS here, I actually already have that command uh, installed. And so we'll just watch it do its thing. Yeah. And so if we go back into the Linux environment, inside of the, the Nix shell, You'll see the wormhole uh, tool just went ahead and closed. That's, I think, where they get the name from, because the idea is you have it uh, installed on, or in this case, not necessarily installed, but you have a copy of it available. You start it up, and then you have someone else that uses the same tool, passes in that nice little code. And it works, as you can tell. Uh, I've used that to transfer a little, a little bigger file, but yeah, uh, that's a quick example. So yeah, I think that those are the three kind of primary examples that I wanted to just sort of talk through, like for me, that I found helpful uh, using this, this package manager or this tool. I, I think there's a lot more you can do with it, and uh, particularly around uh, using it uh, as a sort of manager of the various dependencies that your projects or your system might have. And what I mean by that is, if you're working in, say, a JavaScript or a Python project, you, chances are you might have, uh, like I know in JavaScript, you, you need a package, uh, package.json, which is going to list out those dependencies. And you have a dedicated package manager, like NPM or Yarn, to actually do the work of going and getting those things so your project will run. Uh, but what happens when you have some kind of build tool, like a particular version of, say, the Bash shell, or something like JQ for some quick and dirty JSON processing, there's not really a good way to do that. Uh, it's very dependent on what kind of system you're running, and maybe even the familiarity or the willingness of who's running it to get their hands dirty. You know, go out to GitHub, download it, put it in the path, all that nonsense. And so in that way, I like to think of Nix, uh, and particularly Flakes, as a generic package manager. Like it's flexible and it's more for systems. So you can think more broadly. Instead of saying, oh, 
I need JavaScript or I need Python installed at this given version, what you can say is, here are some packages that I need and want to share with my team. And all you need to have installed then is Nix, the package manager itself. And then you can go in and just run Nix shell and Nix develop. Uh, I think to kind of close on that note, what I'm going to do is just show like a really practical example of how this works. Um, so if I go, let me see here. Let's go here. So this is a, a project that uh, I work in that's an API server. So it's a JavaScript version, uh, a JavaScript ser server, I should say. So what we like to do is, um, and I'll just show you here, there's a flake lock and a flake.nix. And another like, important thing to note is nix flakes have a notion of locking as well. So that way, when I say nix packages hash something, we're getting a predictable version. It's not just up to chance or the day that you happen to run it or your system's state. And so here is an example. I, I can look at that briefly. But what our team can do is just run nix develop. And what it's actually going to do is provision a file. Well, the file itself really declares what we need. And what it does is it provisions all of the things that I say in this file in our path. And so that, that's something that I found immensely useful because the more projects that I have to manage and the more uh, nuances with their particular versions, uh, the less that I care about managing them. So it's kind of this uh, frustrating inverse relationship. Um, and so here is a good example of it's even pulling in like Python at a, at a given version. Uh, but what I found like really liberating about this is it, it takes away the headaches for me. Uh, so I, I don't actually have to get into the weeds of managing Python toolchains um, or JavaScript toolchains for that matter. Like I can think a bit more uh, broadly and abstractly. And so I'll just take a quick peek at uh, the actual file there. Uh, it's called a flake.nix. If we kind of look at it, I asked a colleague. Like, I've, I've been working with Nix for a couple years. Hey, how do you feel about Nix? He's like, the syntax sucks. <laughs> so, so if you're like, that looks really weird, I don't like it, that's, that's quite all right. Uh, but this is just an example of like provisioning a shell and our project, all of the things that we need, which get into some like pretty nitty gritty stuff. And a uh, fun thing is like, we can do whole like database environments too. So it's like uh, enabled us to do a lot of work uh, reproducibly across a team, as well as I should say the most practical use that I found for this is being able to run CI and CD pipelines off of this. So again, this works uh, in a Linux context. You can install Nix directly on Mac, but this flexibility of being able to have a manifest that has all these things uh, and then just go to uh, some other Linux runner somewhere, like whether that's GitLab or, or even GitHub, it's immensely powerful. Because then I'm not worrying about debugging how to get that particular version of Node or Python on not one, not two, three, four different kinds of machines. So for me, I found that to be quite helpful in the place that I'm at. And so now you'll see we're using you know, version 18 of Node. But this is an alternative to kind of that snippet I started with, where I was showing you how to just say, hey, give me from Nix packages this tool. What I'm doing actually per project here is I have a file, much like your package JSON, that's actually expressing which version of Node it wants. And then pretend I was a different developer going in. I don't really need to know. I can just run Nix develop. So, but yeah, that's uh, the conclusion of my talk. Here's some administrivia. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>